Maps is a nonprofit um, educational organization, advocacy organization that owns a pharmaceutical company. So now we're two different organizations. One is Maps, that is the nonprofit that I started in April 1986, so 34 years ago. And then the other is the Maps Public Benefit Corporation which uh, I started in December 2014. And so that's our pharmaceutical drug development arm. And that is a benefit corporation, means it's for profit. It will sell MDMA for profit, but whatever profits are made will go towards more research not and more education, not towards any personal gain because the 100% owner of the benefit corp is the nonprofit. And I'd say that our main goal is to really mainstream psychedelics, to make them available not just through medicine um, but also through drug policy reform like you have in Portugal but I don't think it goes far enough in Portugal you know we need to go from decriminalization to legalization to taxation to pure drugs available for people that have licenses and a licensed legalization system where if you misbehave you would be punished for your misbehavior and you would also lose your license to buy the drug for a period of time we don't work only with war veterans as i said that most of the people that are have ptsd there's roughly eight million people that have ptsd in the united states and a lot more have ptsd at a lower level they wouldn't be a, they have trauma at a lower level that might not qualify for a diagnosis of ptsd and so what we've found is in our phase two studies, which we did in Israel, Canada, Switzerland, and the United States, um, the treatment is basically three and a half months. There's three MDMA sessions, one month apart, and then there's 12 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions, three before the first for uh, preparation, and then three after each one for integration. And so the control group is people can get therapy in this way, but inactive placebo or low dose MDMA that's not active. And the experimental group gets the same amount of therapy, but gets uh, active doses of MDMA. So what we found at the two month follow up after the last experimental session, which is the point in time, it's called the primary outcome measure. And that's where the regulatory agencies are going to try to compare the two groups, the control group and then the experimental group. And so what we showed is for chronic severe treatment resistant people with PTSD, that in the control group, 23% no longer had PTSD at the two month. Now that's not, you know, it's less than a quarter, it's around a quarter, but it's actually really good for people that are chronic severe and have failed before on either medication or psychotherapy or potentially both. When you add MDMA though, they get the therapy with MDMA, active MDMA, 56% no longer have PTSD. So more than double, it's, it's much, much better. But then the question is, does it last? So we can get the drug approved and then will insurance companies pay for it or will nat national insurance companies throughout Europe pay for it? So that has to do with, will it last? because this is more expensive at the very beginning than just giving somebody a pill or just doing therapy one hour once a week. So what we showed at the 12 month follow-up was phenomenally great news is that two thirds of the people no longer have PTSD. And what that means is that people keep getting better. They've learned how to process difficult emotions from the MDMA, helping them not feeling overwhelmed and they've seen that if you let these things come to the surface and you kind of express them and work through them, then you can actually not be so um, obsessed or um, focused on that afterwards. So that going through pain and sadness in a short term can help in the long run. So this idea that two thirds no longer are PTSD at the 12 month follow up is incredibly encouraging. there's going to be more depression, more anxiety, more isolation. Um, it's going to be a very strong challenge to bring people back to where um, they're comfortable uh, being in close association with others and not just uh, in their own pods or their own small groups. So I, what I'm particularly worried about 
is that where people are um, sort of engaging in social contact, it's with their close friends. It's with the people that they're already familiar with. But what we need to do in this world more and more is reach out to quote the other, the people that are different from us and to learn more about them and to, to see the common humanity and to build bridges with people that are different from us. Like what the uh, EMA is saying that we should do work with refugees and migrants in Europe. And I think there's gonna be a lot less of that. People are gonna stay in their close groups. They're gonna be reluctant to move out of them. So I, I see a lot of long lasting problems coming from the social isolation. And I think those are the kind of problems that will only be solved by um, deep human relationships again that we can establish so that's going to be um, one of the things we're trying to think about is after um, being optimistic after we've raised all the money and completed the work and obtained approval for mdma for ptsd what are some of the other things that we would be looking at and i think social anxiety will be one of the top ones that we're going to look at Just to, to first off meditate on the, the uh, way in which we're really interconnected. That has never been more apparent. A virus that starts in China, that travels all over the world, that, that um, spreads um, through human contact. It's, um, it's just amazing now how many people have died from it, how many millions of people have it, how, how much it's kind of um, paralyzed the entire world. So the, the good side of that, you could say, the silver lining is that we realize now um, how interconnected we are. Pay a lot of attention, don't run away from the feelings of anxiety, of hopelessness, of fear. Um, Stan Groff, uh, who's sort of the, uh, my mentor and many others, the leading expert in psychedelic psychotherapy, he said something beautiful, which is that um, the full expression of an emotion is the funeral pyre of that emotion. And what he means by that is that if you fully experience um, hopelessness, that it will change. If you defend against it, it will stay. So we know this with grief. You know, you can be very sad at the end of a relationship or someone dying and you can hold in your emotions, but once you could let it out, and cry you can feel the grief then you can move on just um, think about um, simple kindness you know how people you know we overlook that, that things have to be super dramatic or um, you know larger than ever before or, or not but in this era very simple kindnesses can uh, make a big difference both to the person that uh, is kind and to the person that receives kindness so I would say look for opportunities to be kind to people. Bloom is the world example of psychedelic harm reduction. It's the best example in the entire world that I know of, where a festival has really embraced psychedelic harm reduction. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, because Portugal is in a decriminalized situation, um, in the United States, there's been some fear that when you do harm reduction, that means that you know psychedelic drugs are being used, and then you could be uh, criminalized or attacked or taken uh, to jail. I think with Boom, what you have is Cosmic Care, which is out where everybody can see it. It's not hidden away. Everybody knows that it's there, and it's supported by Boom Festival. And at the same time, there's uh, drug checking that's taking place on site so that users can bring their drugs without worry of prosecution and have them analyzed within a very short period of time so that they know what they're taking. It's really important to have drug checking so people know what they're doing. Um, and I think Boom Festival is uh, well ahead of um, other groups all over the world that's doing that because it's on private property and it's in a decriminalized context, it's easier to do that. So I, I think what's so impressive to me about Boom is not only do they have cosmic care out in the open, supported by uh, the festival organizers, not only do they have drug checking, but the lecture series and the education that's taking place for all of the people that are attending it to learn about psychedelics and learn about how they're used. I think that's really important because those of us who, uh, most of us, I would say, have been subjected to a lot of propaganda about how harmful these drugs are, and it's hard to separate out fact from fiction. 
and you don't know what to believe. And then there's important warnings that could be overlooked because the whole system is coming to support prohibition, the whole system of education. So I think what Boom does exceptionally well through the lecture series is have um, honest education for people that are at the festival where they're not scared about asking questions or showing up. So I, I think that what Boom is, is kind of uh, like you could say a lighthouse in the dark, you know, as um, a guiding principle for events all over the world.